Hello and welcome to Tech Deals. If you watch enough tech YouTubers and read enough tech websites, you might conclude that the only Intel CPUs that exist end with the letter K. With few exceptions, Intel's top-end enthusiast CPUs end in the letter K, which means they are unlocked for overclocking. Today, we're going to compare the brand new i5-11600K versus the i5-11400 locked CPU to see if there really is any difference in gaming performance and if the extra money is really worth it. Today's video is brought to you by Backblaze, the leader in online backup services. Get a free two week trial, no credit card required, using our link in the video description below. More details after the video. Recently, we compared the new 11th generation Rocket Lake i5-11600K to the AMD Ryzen 5 5600X at 1440p to see how these $300 CPUs compare in a real world gaming environment. Now that comparison is linked down in the video description below. And if you'd like all the details behind that testing, why we're at 1440p and all the details behind the new 11th generation Rocket Lake, watch that video for all the juicy details. Today, we're focused purely on the two Intel CPUs, so a few details about those and the differences between them is in order. First, what is the same between them? Both are six core, 12-thread chips featuring Intel's hyper-threading technology. Both have the same core design on the CPU itself. They both install into LGA 1200 sockets on a 400 or 500 series motherboard, and both officially support up to DDR4 3200. Effectively, they are the same CPU, almost. So what is different between them, you may ask? The 11600K is unlocked, so it can be manually overclocked and tuned to run higher than rated speeds for maximum performance. Now this sounds better in theory than in practice. More on that in a minute. The 11600K has an all-core turbo speed out of the box of 4.6 gigahertz. More on that in a minute as well. The 11400 has an all-core turbo speed of 4.2 gigahertz, and it cannot be increased beyond this number. The 11600K has UHD 750 onboard graphics, which provides 32 execution units. If you plan to play games using the onboard GPU, this matters. If you don't, then it doesn't. The 11400 has UHD 730 onboard graphics, which provides 24 execution units, a substantial decrease from the 32 on the 11600K. The 11600K does not come with any cooling solution whatsoever. You must provide your own. The 11400 does come with Intel's stock cooler in the box, which is not great, but it does the job and it serves as a nice backup should you ever need a spare. And honestly, that's about all this should probably be used for. Regarding overclocking, the all-core turbo speed is not the base clock, nor is it the max overclock, but it is what you'll typically see under most load conditions. That means if you do nothing at all other than give the 11600K a reasonably good cooling, it will run at 4.6 gigahertz no matter what load you put it under, so long as it's installed on a half-decent board from one of the main board companies, such as ASUS, Gigabyte, MSI, ASRock, or a few others. This is because they actually exceed the normal power limits that Intel suggests and why the CPU can pull more than 150 watts when it has a TDP of 125. The 11400 has a TDP of just 65 watts and an all-core turbo of 4.2. You cannot run an 11400 at 4.2 gigahertz under a full load within a 65 watt power envelope. It simply takes more power than this to do that. Now it is not a problem if you put it on a reasonably decent motherboard with a reasonably decent cooler since those ignore the power limits and let the chip run where it wants. A Hyper 212 Evo or a Deep Cool Gamex 400 is plenty to run the CPU all day long at 4.2 gigahertz without any concerns even in a fairly warm room. This brings me to the 11600K and overclocking. 
I spent several hours trying different settings to get to 5 gigahertz. However, it was not stable at a voltage level and temperature that I was comfortable with recommending to you. My typical limit on voltage is 1.35 volts and it took more than that to get 5 gigahertz out of this chip. This is also a good time to point out that I am using a Corsair H150i Pro 360mm liquid cooler, which is way overkill for a $300 six-core chip. Even with this cooler installed, at 1.425 volts at 5 gigahertz, the temperatures climbed way too high for my liking. 4.8 gigahertz was a comfortable overclock that would work at 1.35 volts on a more reasonable cooler. However, those aren't the numbers you'll see today. Why? Because that's really pointless and not worth your time. Overclocking removes a lot of energy saving features, it increases power consumption by way more than it increases performance, it makes more heat and noise, all for a 200 megahertz clock speed difference that is pointless outside of bragging rights. If you doubt this, let me offer you a comparison. 4.6 gigahertz and 4.8 gigahertz could be compared to driving down the road at 46 miles per hour versus 48 miles per hour. The ratio is the same. Without looking at a digital speed readout, could you tell the difference looking out the window? Of course not, it's a rounding error. I can hear you all already and spoiler alert, but does that mean that the 4.2 gigahertz of the 11400 versus the 4.6 gigahertz of the 11600K is also a minor difference? Congratulations, you're catching on. Those of you who know, already know this. Those of you who don't, hopefully this video enlightens you on how pointless small differences really are. Now that I've said that, allow me to prove it to you. Also, please watch this whole video because watch time is engagement and it will encourage me to just get to the point more in future videos if you all watch the whole thing. Today's CPUs were tested at stock clock speeds with only XMP enabled in the BIOS to enable the RAM to run at its rated speed. The RAM, cooler, board, and GPU were exactly the same on the two Intel CPUs, and I will be including the Ryzen 5 5600X numbers here for your reference so you don't have to cross compare to the prior video. We are testing today only in 1440p, not 1080p, and if you want to know why, well, watch the linked video in the description below because it explains it in great detail. Anno 1800 is first, and if you look carefully at the numbers, we have an effective tie. Yes, I know it's terribly exciting. You're going to see this pattern repeat, so rather than take forever to get through all of the games here, how about we just skip all the separate individual charts and just do one big comparison chart of all 10 games and these two CPUs with the 5600X thrown in. Not just yet, of course, we do need to put footage up here to show you the real captured tests. This is Assassin's Creed Odyssey, a game I'll continue to test for a short while until we do our big GPU roundup. This is Assassin's Creed Valhalla, much more demanding and GPU limited than Odyssey. It's an exact tie here on the averages and close enough on the 1% low. Borderlands 3 is so GPU bottlenecked here that the 1% low was only a single frame per second off, 104 frames per second on the 11600K and 105 on the 11400. I can hear you already, but wait, tech, how is the 11400 faster than the 11600K? Easy, those are the rounding errors and the result moves one or two frames per second every time you run this benchmark. F1 2020 does show a difference, and if you're a 240 hertz gamer, this is where the extra clock speed really matters. I really don't test for that, however. 144 hertz is the sweet spot of value and performance for most people, with 60 hertz honestly fine for most. 281 frames per second on the 11600K versus 262 frames per second on the 11400. So yes, the K chip wins with its 400 megahertz higher clock speed, but at this level, does it really matter? Ghost Recon Breakpoint is another time with 175 frames per second average on both CPUs. 
Yes, we're at 1440p. Yes, we're GPU bound for the most part, but we have an RTX 3080. Of course we're at 1440p. Stick an RTX 2060 Super on both CPUs, lower the resolution to 1080p, and you'll still be GPU bound. So what's the difference? Horizon Zero Dawn is faster on the 11600K by one frame per second. Yes, really. 130 versus 129 on the 11400. Yeah, that's worth almost $100 more. Pardon my dripped sarcasm. Don't slip on the floor. We just had it waxed. The Division 2 is next. My fifth favorite game in the past two years. Also a one frame per second difference on the average 165 to 164. Be still my beating heart. Watch Dogs Legion rounds this up with another win for the 11400 at 117 versus 116 on the 11600K. Another rounding error that happens when you run these tests over and over and get slightly different results based on the position of the moon, solar flares, and where I misplaced my magic eight ball. Here's the chart showing all 10 games and their average frame rates on all three CPUs. Exciting stuff. All I can really say here is that if you turn the frame rates off, you couldn't tell any of these CPUs apart in the real world. Lower the resolution to 1080p, lower the GPU to an RX 5600 XT or an RTX 2060 Super, and the results would be almost the same. Here are the frame rates for average 1% lows, which again is not the most exciting chart in the world, but it demonstrates that these two CPUs are very similar in real world performance. Yes, Virginia, I did spend all day testing, scripting, and filming this to tell you what I've said endlessly during our Rogue Tech Show live streams. Overclocking is dead, K-chips are pointless, and none of this has mattered for the past few generations. There are exceptions and outliers to this. The first and second generation of Ryzen non-X chips did have overclocking headroom worth exploring. The Ryzen 7 1700 ran at 3.2 gigahertz stock and it could overclock to 4.0 gigahertz on a good cooler and a good motherboard. That made a noticeable real world difference. Likewise, older Intel CPUs had huge margins for overclocking. The i7-2600K ran at 3.5 GHz all core out of the box. However, it was very easy to get 4.5 GHz on it, even using a fairly basic cooler. Mine runs at stock voltage on a 120 mm baby liquid cooler, and it would go higher if I bothered to tweak it. The temps were a non-issue. However, that was another time. Today, the K-chip mostly serves as a soft, warm blanket of good feelings without actually doing anything useful. We recently built an i7-10700 PC, and it runs at 4.6 gigahertz on all eight cores without any complaint using a basic tower cooler. Honestly, why bother with expensive K-chips and fancy liquid coolers when you no longer need them? The only issue with the 11400 is the onboard graphics. If you have any interest in using them, get the i5-11500 instead. It has the same UHD 750 as the 11600K for less money, while keeping the same 4.2 GHz all-core speed of the 11400. Or for that matter, just get the 11600K, put a Hyper 212 or Gamex 400, or maybe a 120 millimeter baby liquid cooler on it, run it at stock speeds, and be a very happy camper. One final thought. If you'd like to see testing with the iGPU on the 11600K, or a follow-up with an RTX 3060 at 1080p with DDR4-3200, let me know in the comment section below. If there's enough interest, I'll do both of those tests. Backblaze is the leader in online backup services. Back up everything on your computer, including external USB hard drives for just $6 per month with no limits. No file size limits, no backup size limits, no throttling and multi-threaded upload support. Multiple security options, including two-factor authentication and private encryption keys are available. Rapid restore with file downloads, plus the option to have your data shipped to you via USB hard drive, File version support keeps multiple copies of files as you change them to allow recovery of older files or accidentally deleted files with the option to keep locally deleted files in your backup 
forever. Sign up for a free two-week trial using our link in the video description below. No credit card is required. Give it a try. Test your backup speed. Do a test restore to make sure you're happy with it before paying anything. We have been paying customers of Backblaze for nine years, long before we had a YouTube channel, and we highly recommend it. Thank you all so much for watching to the very end of this video. Two gold stars for all of you. Like this video if you like it. Share it with your friends if you love it. Remember, subscribe to the channel with the big huge red button directly below. Hit the bell notification icon to actually be notified when new videos come out. Smash that join button if you'd like to support the channel for just $2 per month and get a whole host of benefits details down below. Comment section below. Love reading your comments. Links in the video description below. All of these CPUs will be linked to Amazon, eBay, and New. Egg. Those are affiliate links. They support the channel at no extra cost to you. Clicking those, no matter what you end up buying, even if it's a jar of peanut butter, supports the channel and is greatly, greatly appreciated. Thank you so much for watching. I will see all of you next time. And I will be including the Ryzen 5 56... 56... Today's CPUs were texted... Te te texted. This is Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Much more demanding and GPU limited than a sock than a sock. So the teleprompter is tired. <laughs> you might conclude that the only Intel CPUs that exist end in the letter K, so it can be manually overclocked and tuned to run at higher than rated maximum speeds for the maximum rated performance. That was not the words that were on the screen. Shake left, shake to the right. Get the, gotta get the wiggles out. That way you can loosen it up. This is where we insert the Rocky theme.